Good morning. So last week we kicked off the series called, called, series called Follow, What is a Disciple of Jesus? Kind of sounds like we're playing Jeopardy. What is a disciple of Jesus, Alex? Well, that's the question, not the answer. That's the question we're focusing on in this series. And let me just ask a question. What mental picture comes to mind when you hear the word disciple? Anybody? Twelve? The Last Supper? Kung Fu? I'll allow it. All right. Anything else? What comes to mind when you hear the word disciple? What's that? Sandals? Yeah, yeah. Visco, sandals, yeah. Anyway, so, so here's the deal. Like, this is why it's important, like, we get the mental picture right. Not because we need to remember who the disciples were, but we need to understand what disciples are because Jesus asked us as a church, and if you're a part of a church, that includes you, any church, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, he gave this commission to you. He told us in what's called the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, if we don't know what a disciple is, how can we do that? And it's not just the mental picture. That's kind of something because our mental pictures really help shape us. A lot of times, if we just say disciple, we can all start nodding, but we might be picturing different things. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with sandals or suppers or things like that. But it has to do with this idea, this definition of what a disciple is. So what is a disciple? That's the goal of this series, to look at the specific statements that Jesus gave. Very specific statements. When he said, by doing this or by being this, you are my disciple. Or by not doing this, you aren't my disciple. He was very, very clear. So I, I mean, clarity is something that we can have. Because Jesus wants us to have it and he gave it to us. One of the questions I want you to think about, this a word of disciple and kind of understanding what it means. Let me, let me ask you to think about it this way. Who disciples you? Because everybody is discipled by someone or something. Everyone is shaped by someone or something. And that's what a disciple is. It's a learner of something. It's someone who's being shaped by someone, informed by someone, sometimes transformed by someone. Someone is shaping you. Whoever that is or whatever it is, that's what you're a disciple of. Because our working definition of what a disciple means in this series is this. A disciple is an apprentice of Jesus who becomes like Jesus. An apprentice, a learner, a student. The Greek word is the word uh, mateus, which means a learner, a pupil. Someone who learns by following. But in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, when Jesus said, he didn't give us a noun he gave us a verb, make disciples. That's all one Greek word. It's a noun, it's something you are. It's a verb, it's something you do. To go make learners, to go make pupils, to go make students of who learn by following Jesus. And the reason the word make is so important is it means there's something that we do that influences that, but it also reminds us being a disciple and making disciples and those are the two lenses I want you to look through as we talk about this. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you should be a disciple of Jesus, right? So it matters for you and what it means for you to be a follower of Jesus. But it also matters because if you're a follower of Jesus, he asked you to go make disciples. So you want to look at, look at it in terms of what does it mean for the noun, for me to be a disciple, but also to try and influence others to follow Jesus and be his disciples. The thing is, it is a process. There's no such thing as an instant disciple. You can't just add water and, and make a disciple. It's a process of growth and learning. And the challenge we're giving in this series is to consider those two lenses, being a disciple and making disciples. And the challenge is to be one, be a disciple that's learning from Jesus and becoming more like Jesus, and make some. And that challenge is so important to me because I want you to be part of a church that makes disciples. Because if we're not a church that makes disciples, I'm not sure we should be a church. Because I think that's what a church is supposed to be. A gathering of people, an ecclesia, a gathering of people that are responsible and responsive to this great commission given by Jesus. And one of the reasons I want that for you is I want you to grow in your faith. And I know that you will grow in your faith 
if you participate in what Jesus is doing by being a disciple and making disciples. Because one of the theories I have is that a disciple grows when a disciple disciples. If you're engaged in discipling others, you're going to grow. They, sh they can grow, but I really think it's a lot about your faith, and I want that for you. And I want you to be part of a church that gets it right. So let's look a little bit further at Jesus' great commission. And today what I want to talk about is what Dallas Willard called the great omission. See what he did there? Great commission, great omission. There's something that we frequently omit when it comes to this idea of the great commission. And he, Jesus went on and said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. He, Joe talked about that a minute, a minute ago. That might be your next step. We encourage that next step because Jesus said that's kind of part of what you do by being a, part, being a part of making disciples. That might be your next step. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all about God and who he is. And then he says this, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. There's, when Jesus said go and make disciples, he doesn't really define it. He doesn't stop and say, now let me define it for you in four points. A disciple is this, this, isn't this, isn't this. He doesn't do that. But there are only two qualifiers he gives in this whole statement about a disciple. They're baptized and they obey. He says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what you have to think is in your de definition of a disciple, it's a follower of Jesus who obeys Jesus. Because he said, if you're going to make disciples, well, what does that mean? Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's an incredibly important part of the Great Commission. What Dallas Willis would say is part of the great omission is that we omit the very idea of making disciples as being important. That's one of the goals of this series. No, we want to elevate the importance. It is important that we make disciples. We don't settle, settle for crowds, attendance, or participation. If Live Oak grows in number but doesn't make in disciples, I'm not sure it's a good thing it grows. But he said the great omission is we don't ask people to obey when clearly it was important to Jesus. One of the problems is obedience can get weird in a hurry. Not everyone who obeys is a disciple. Obedience isn't how you get into God's family. But clearly it's important to Jesus. So not everyone who obeys what Jesus says is a disciple, but every, every disciple, Jesus would say, they obey everything he's commanded us. It's one of only two qualifiers in the Great Commission. Let me talk for a second about what obedience is and isn't. So at Live Oak, we have a strategy for making disciples. I don't know if you know this. We call it the Great Connections. It's based on the Great Commission, excuse me, the Great uh, Commandment, love God with all you have and love your neighbors yourself, and the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And we really see there's four connections that we want everyone to connect themselves and others to. Connected to God first and foremost, that's the priority. Connected to him, connected to God's word, connected to God's people, and connected to God's mission. One of the things I started thinking about last year is in my own life, if I'm connected to only one of the four, it can get weird in a hurry. It can get unhealthy. Uh, let's say if I'm just connected to God's word, I place a real high value on scripture. It plays an important role in my life. It's been transformational in my life. Uh, we lean on it significantly here. It's the basis for, for our teachings and what we do. But if I just focus on God's word, but I don't focus on God with that primary relationship with him, it can become like a checklist. It's drill sergeant spirituality. My faith is about as how many spiritual push-ups I can do and how much I do right and how little I do wrong. That can get real unhealthy because God is a God of grace. But suddenly it, become, it can become an act of obedience as the only thing that means that's the mark of a follower of Jesus. It's a mark of a follower of Jesus, but it's not the only thing he says. Like for me, if I'm connected to God, when I read God's word, he works in it and through it in my life. I need both of those connections. And if I'm not connected to God's people, let's say I just get those two right, but I'm never connected to God's people, well, how do I apply love your neighbors yourself when I don't have any neighbors? How do I practice the Great Commission if I don't connect with other people? 
to make disciples. How do I practice encouraging one another if there's no other? Connected to God's people is important for application. And then if I'm not connected to God's mission, then it's all about me. See, all four of these are important, right? And if I'm connected to all four, it's a framework where God can work in my life using all four of these influences as input and output in my life. Does that make sense? So, so here's the problem with obedience. If I just focus on obedience and I go, I'm going to be a disciple who obeys, that's great. Jesus says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded. I'm pretty close. <laughs> Can't say I'm everything, but I'm getting there. Like, if you just do that, I think you're going to get missed that definition of what a disciple truly is. Yes, it's part of the definition, but it's not the only thing. It's a very important thing, but it's not the only thing. Because a disciple isn't something you do, it's something you are. It's an identity. And Jesus doesn't give you a to-do list. He actually gives you a to-be list. And the problem with a to-be list is it's hard to do that on my own. Exactly, that's why you've got to be connected to God. He does this in you and through you. I don't know if obedience is the thing that transforms my life as much as it is that the obedience connects me to God at a significant way where he can transform me from the inside out. And some of the reasons some of us have been frustrated in seasons of our spiritual life is we tried to transform our lives on our own. You are not a do-it-yourself fixer-upper where God says, go check in the spiritual version of Home Depot or Lowe's. I don't want to offend any retailers in town, uh, equal opportunity. Until one of them pays for sponsorship, I'm not going to give one preference. So like, if I like, go, go to the spiritual version of Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever and just do your best to fix it up. Just obey everything and you'll be transformed from the inside out. I don't think it works that way. I think obedience sets you up to be transformed by God. If you just think, if I do everything right, my Heavenly Father will like me more. You're not doing this for his approval. You already have it. You're not doing this to kind of, you know, check, get all the check marks and get an A on your spiritual report card. It's not based on performance. It's based on identity and who you are in Christ. But at the same time, he says obedience is important. And one of the reasons we're spending several weeks on the definition is if we just said, oh, a disciple is someone who just obeys everything he says, it's an incomplete definition. It'd be like if you went to school and you said, I just took writing. Didn't even focus on reading, I just, but I got A's in writing. Eventually, like you wouldn't move on to the next grade. Like it's, 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 and it's not and it's even a bad analogy because it's not a curriculum, but it's just one aspect of your faith. But don't miss this. It's a very important part. Obedience, for whatever reason, was important enough that Jesus in the Great Commission said, go make disciples. Teach them to obey everything I commanded them. Obedience clearly mattered. In John 8, 31, we see that it's not just something he wants from us, it's something he wants for us. He's talking to some, some people who are trying to figure out who he was and what to do with them, and he said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. A follower of Jesus who obeys Jesus, that's a disciple. It's one of the marks. It's not the only mark, but it is a very important aspect of what a disciple is. If you hold to my teachings, some, if you have a different translation of the Bible, it might say, if you remain in my teaching, if you abide in my teaching, if my teaching is in you and it's the cent a central part of your life, if it's your how you live your life if, is based on my, on my teaching. You're a disciple. You're, he didn't say you're a disciple. He says, you're really my disciple. Like he throws that in there. He emphasizes that this is a distinguishing mark. It's something he wants for us. Because he goes on to say, very truly, I tell you. Yeah, go to that next verse there. If you hold my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's freedom in obedience, and it seems counterintuitive. So here's the question I want to ask you. When's the last time you did something simply because Jesus asked you to? That's obedience. If Jesus asks you to do something, that you read about it, or sometimes it's a prompt where he goes, don't say that. Don't say that. Or don't, don't, don't watch that. Or take that next step. Speak up. Go make it right. Whatever it is, if, if Jesus tells you to do something, 
and you do it, that's obedience. When was the last time you did something or didn't do something simply because Jesus asked you to or asked you not to? That's obedience. And he wants something for us because he goes on to say this, verse 34. Whoever has my commands and keeps them. Oh, excuse me. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So you're going to be a disciple of something. And if you're saying yes to the wrong things, you're going to become a disciple of that thing. It has power and influence over your life. And in fact, he uses the analogy, you'll be a slave to sin. If you say yes to what Jesus says, don't do this or steer clear of this, you become a slave to it. It's, it's imprisoning. It captures you. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son or daughter belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, if God sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus wants us to be free, transformed, made new, released from whatever imprisons us or holds us back. He wants something for us that's so much better than anything we could want for ourselves. He says, I, what's, your, what's your deepest desire? He goes, I can do better than even what you think. I can set you free. In John 14, 21, he said, whoever has my commands and keeps them, again, he says, obedience is a key part of this, is the one who loves me. So what he says, it's an evidence of a transformed life. It's not how you get God to love you, but it's one of the ways you worship him and show him, I love you. Have you ever thought obedience, of obedience as an act of worship? By saying yes to what God wants is it simply a way of saying, God, I, I want to honor you and show you my love for you. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. You can experience Jesus personally in this act of obedience. This is evidence of life change. And it's evidence of surrender. He goes on to say this. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. It's a sign of our love for him. My Father will love them, and we will welcome them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So he starts saying, here it is, and here's what it isn't. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And he says, when you listen to those, when you respond to those by saying yes, it's an expression of love. It's an act of love. It's an act of worship. But not everyone who obeys necessarily is a disciple, and not every dis but every disciple will do this, will obey. But it's possible just to say, I'm going to check as many boxes as possible and not really surrender my heart to God. But I think it's impossible to surrender your heart and make him the leader of your life and not be obedient. I think it's going to be an evidence, an outward evidence of an inward change. And again, it's not something Jesus wants for us, or from us, it's something he wants for us. In John 13, 17, he said this, Now that you know these things, what he's taught you, you will be blessed if you do them. Blessed means it's to your advantage. There is spiritual favor and blessing, like there's something to this. This is the place where you want to live. Obedience is marking the boundaries of where God's blessing is. And when we dance outside the lines and move outside the lines and play out outside the lines, we can't be surprised if life doesn't work like it's supposed to work. Staying in the lines is not a guarantee that everything's going to go perfectly. Jesus was very honest. In this world, you will have trouble. Some of the trouble I experience is self-imposed. Because I know God says, guard your mind, guard your heart. Guard your tongue, all these different things. And when I step out of line, I shouldn't be surprised if things don't go well. But what he says is there's something sacred about this area where God says, this is the path I have for you. And there's a ditch over here and there's a ditch over here. Stay on the path because life is better on the path than in the ditch. I mean, it's an analogy that's, analogy that's lost on us in West Texas, but when I used to be a hockey chaplain, it was very relevant, but usually up north in the winter, it freezes over and people can go skating on ponds. Don't do that here unless you want to go swimming. But if there, you can do that. You can go and you can skate on it, play hockey on it, do whatever it is. And there's parts where they would have a sign that says, danger, thin ice. Don't skate over here. 
Very few, I've never heard of somebody being bitter that they said, well, they restricted our access to skating over here. They're taking our fun from us. No, it was a protective measure. When you see a danger keep out sign, it's usually a sign of one of two things. There's something dangerous there that people want, someone wants to protect you from experiencing, or an introvert lives there. Danger, keep out, right? When we see a danger keep out sign, that is an expression of someone's care and value on your life. That's what obedience is. It's a blessed place if you stay where God says it's to your advantage. It's the best place you could be. So look back at the Great Commission. Jesus is therefore go and make disciples. What does that mean exactly? Well, we're working on that. But we know that a part of it has to do with obedience. A follower of Jesus who obeys Jesus. Oh, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So there's two aspects of this. The one aspect is, for me as a disciple, am I obeying everything Jesus commanded me? Is there an area where I'm holding back? Is there an area where I'm not doing what I ought to do? I need to let Jesus disciple me and help me understand, God, what have you commanded me to do? And what does obedience look like in this situation? And I do think a helpful question is to ask, when's the last time I did something simply because Jesus asked me to? Or when's the last time I didn't do something? I said no to something simply because Jesus asked me to. And if you can't think of examples of that, you may not be very mindful about obedience in your life. Think about what it looks like to put God in charge, to follow him and not ask him to follow you, but to follow him. But obedience is just one aspect of this. There are two mistakes we can make in terms of this great omission. One is the great omission is that we've not really made disciples if we've not taught them to obey. By the way, just kind of one footnote about that. Teaching someone to obey, how much control do you have over their, them saying yes or no to Jesus? Zero. I mean, some of us know because we've been parents or coaches or teachers or bosses and we've said, okay, here's what I want you to do, and they don't do it. I don't have control over their compliance. Don't view obedience as compliance. That's not obedience. Compliance is begrudging. Compliance is I have to. Obedience is surrender. It's get to. It's surrendering to Jesus. But I have zero control over somebody else's yes. What I have control of, of, am I teaching them? Am I calling people to more? Am I pointing people to what Jesus says? Because he said, this is a mark of not just the disciple, this is a mark of people who make disciples. You will baptize them. You will teach them. That's to us as disciple makers of making some that we would do that. And the two mistakes we make is we either leave it out and we don't call people to obedience or the other mistake is we make it the only part of being a disciple. This is not the only time Jesus said, if you do this, you're really my disciple. He said that other times, and we're going to look at those. But this is a key one. And in my life, when I've said yes to Jesus, especially when it's been hard, those have been transformational moments. I don't feel like he loved me more, but I understand his love better. And I experience transformation as my will and my self-focus was torn down to where my obedience, submission, and surrender to him was built up. There's one other important part of this that can keep this from getting weird. Because again, obedience and just being a, trying to be a yes person to God and saying, I'm just going to say yes and hopefully he'll love me. No, you have his love. You have his approval. That's why he died on the cross. Here's another evidence of why he, I know he loves you. Because he goes on to say, teaching that everything, everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is the most frequently given promise in, throughout the Bible. And it's in there, like cover to cover, again and again and again. God says, I will be with you. And as Jesus ascends to heaven and kind of passes the baton to his disciples, he said, I may be leaving, but it's a good thing that I'm leaving because I'm sending my Holy Spirit. And through my Holy Spirit, I will be with you always. And when you gave your life to Jesus, you did that because he gave his life for you. 
But the good news is, is he gives his life to you, to live his life through you. And he says, I am with you always. There is no time where he is not with you if you've given your life to him. That's why the importance of surrender is important because in that moment I can lean into him and he can lead me well because he's with me and I've surrendered control to him. He is not GPS that's giving me kind of turn by turn directions but I'm on my own way. No, he's with me the whole way trying to lead me the whole way. And I have to get out of the driver's seat and let him drive and let him be in charge. And that's an act of worship. And part of that is obedience. But he says, I will be with you always. And what this does for us, it means that I can be a disciple of Jesus. But I can also be discipled by Jesus every moment of every day. Think about the promise of what this means for tomorrow. You're in a situation. You're in a conversation. You're sitting at your desk. You're sitting at school. You're sitting at, at home. You're, you're, you're commuting. Whatever it is, you're driving around. You're somewhere tomorrow. And in a mo- any given moment, you can say, hey, Jesus, how can I learn from you in this moment? What do you have for me here? Is there something you want me to say yes to? Is there something you want me to say no to? Is there something you want me to say or not say? Is there something you need me to step toward or step away from in this moment? If Jesus is with me at every moment, I can be discipled with him at every moment. It's a bit abstract, which makes it really hard. Because back then, like the disciples we were thinking of at the beginning, with sandals and last suppers and things like that, when Jesus said, follow me, they'd say, oh, he just left the room. We should probably go with him. Like it was very obvious. What does it look like to follow God on a Monday? when he doesn't say, hey, follow me, and walks across the room. It means quieting your soul and listening to the Holy Spirit, becoming familiar with what his voice sounds like through Scripture, having others in your life that are encouraging you and holding you accountable, who can help you discern God's voice. It's being engaged in God's mission where he's working, already at work, and you join him in that. It's through all those things where God is with you and speaking to you, and if you're connected to him, there is not a moment of the day that would not be wasted that he could use to help shape you to become more like him. And if if I'm a Jesus' disciple, that means I am with him to learn from him about how to be like him. I let him define my yeses and my noes. I give him control. I give him surrender. And again, obedience can get weird if we think it's about getting his approval. I know I have his approval because of the cross. I know I have his approval because he says, I want to be with you always. I'm a child of God. I was created by God. I was redeemed by God. I'm, he's with me. Like, I know. I don't, this isn't about approval. It's about submitting to him and letting him lead. It's hard to follow if you're out front. And obedience means I put God in front and I follow. It's part of this transformational process. And we'll get more into that next week as we understand the definition. Obedience is kind of like the outside aspect of being a disciple. But if there's no inside aspect, you just have really good morals. You just have really good behavior. Nothing has changed on the inside. And the good news is Jesus wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to change every single part of you. And for some of you, that's terrifying. Rightfully so. Because if you have a sense, there's a sense of security about being in control of your life. But when you give control to him, that's actually where security begins. And saying yes to him, saying no's to the no's and yes's to the yes's is part of the transformational process of letting go of the things that hold me captive sometimes, including control of my life. So let me ask the question again. When was the last time where you did something simply because Jesus asked you to? Or when was the last time you didn't do something simply because Jesus said, don't and if you can view that as two things 
That's an expression of his love for you. Like if, if we love our kids as parents or teachers or small group leaders, whatever it is, and we tell them no, it's usually, not always, usually because we love them. We want something for them. Our Heavenly Father wants to parent us well and say, will you trust me to give you the right yeses and nos you live in your life? It's an expression of his love, and it's part of this transformational process. Where's an area of your life right now where God is asking you to say yes? And you haven't yet. Where's an area of your life where you're, he's asked you to say no? And you haven't yet. That's an opportunity, not for compliance, but for worship. God, I trust you. I'm grateful to you for all you've done for me. So I'll say yes simply because you asked me to. That's what disciples do, and disciples are transformed in that process. Here's the important thing about defining a disciple. We talked about a disciple is a follower of Jesus who obeys Jesus, but that's not the only aspect of being a disciple. That's why it's important we define it well. A disciple is also a learner of Jesus who becomes like Jesus. We're transformed to be like him. And the heavy lifting is really on him in that process. But there's some responsibility on our side to position ourselves for him to work in our lives. We'll talk about that next week. It's understand that obedience is important. But if it becomes the only aspect of you being a disciple, it can be unhealthy. What would it look like for you tomorrow to let Jesus disciple you, to practice his presence, to believe that he really is with you always, to live like it's true, and to invite him in that moment, not just to give you courage or strength, but to give you direction, to give you commandments, to give you the opportunity to step out of the driver's seat and let him drive and let him lead and let him be in charge. One of the most singular important aspects of obedience is it means I admit I'm not in charge and I open myself up for him to lead myself well. So again, when was the last time you did something or did not do something simply because God asked you to? And to rephrase the question, when will the next time be when you do something or do not do something simply because God asked you to. Let me pray for us. God, thanks that you love us enough to give us commandments. You love us enough to ask for obedience. There's a reason for that. Help us to trust you in that, that you're trying to parent us well. You're trying to lead us well. You're trying to transform us to become more like you. For some of us, we've been compliant children of our Heavenly Father. But you didn't ask for compliance. You asked for obedience, which means submission to the loving rule of our Heavenly Father, to let you be in charge, to not be fearful of you, but to be worshipful of you. God, for some of us who have viewed obedience as something unhealthy, God, correct that. But never, let us never be individuals or, church, or a church that downplays the importance of obedience because it's one of the only qualifiers you gave in the Great Commission. Clearly, it matters to you. Help us to wrestle with it and get it right. To be a disciple who obeys. To make disciples who obey because we know that we are loved and being transformed by our Heavenly Father. God, there are people in the room right now that are struggling this week. They've got challenges that they're not sure what to do. I pray you'd give them wisdom I pray you'd give them resources. I pray you'd give them strength. I pray you'd give them teammates. I pray you'd give them everything they need for their struggles. But God, thank you that the thing we need most, which is you, you've promised to give us always. You said, I will be with you always. Help us to live like it's true and live like we're loved children of our Heavenly Father that trust you enough to obey. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.